Hello, everybody. This is Jordan Lawyer here, and welcome to another episode of Analog Man Cave. I'm gonna, yeah, this is not me. That's Sly Flourish. Uh, he put out a video today, which is really, really good. Now, if you don't know who Sly Flourish is, he's a he's an old blogger. Now he's a YouTuber. I don't want to say old that he's old, but you know, he's he's, he's not 25. <laughs> <laughs> he's been around for a while. He's been talking about this stuff for a long time. And he put out a book, I think is the best book on help, helping somebody to become a dungeon master that there is. Better than any DM guide for any edition ever put out. Even better than the index card RPG DM guide section, which is pretty good in itself. Sly Flourish put out The Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. And it's one of those books that I read. It's like, yes, 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 this makes sense. It sort of helps conceptualize some of the things I, I was doing already. And it helps bring things into a better focus to help me be better at it, right? So this is good. If you guys want, check out his uh, his webpage. Look at Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. You will not regret it. But what he did today was a video on Jay Quay's, uh, Jay Quazing uh, the Dungeon uh but let's apply to overland travel now if you don't know what jay quazing the dungeon is there was a post by the alexandrian a long time ago uh july 33rd 23rd 2010 to be exact about jay quazing the dungeon um justin alexander is a really really smart guy he gets into a lot of game theory and was a huge part of the osr the blogging days okay so he put out this thing talking about how janelle jay Quays, uh did things that were sort of radical and revolutionary and did it in the 70s that people still haven't really mastered. But what she did was she, she developed dungeons in a certain style, all right? Now, Sly Flourish did a good overview of that. I'm not going to spend that much time. I'm going to hit the main concepts because what he talked about was applying it to the wilderness, and that sparked a whole lot of thoughts in my head because I have a problem with wilderness stuff. I have a problem with hex crawls. I don't do it well, and I, I struggle with it. I'm not good at it. It's always... Uh, you know, you're going from this point to that point, and in the middle, you roll some wandering encounters. Now, if you've seen my uh, in earlier videos, I talk about how I'm getting away from wandering encounters because I, I like to pre-prepare my encounters now. Um, I might roll to see what happens, but then I'll develop them out. And this is I, I got this from Tim Shorts. At first, I was shocked and horrified because when we're playing his Colmore Forest game, he says he doesn't do the wandering encounters. He does he rolls up everything ahead of time, figures out what they're going to be, and just goes with it. I, it was so different than what I had ever thought to do because random means, you know, roll on the spot and figure something out. But he ended up giving us such well-designed, pre-prepared encounters using his method. That I'm like, oh, screw this. I'm not going to do this random stuff anymore. I'm going to make it up, you know, ahead of time and as I go. And while that makes it um, different fun, I wouldn't say less fun because there is an element of fun when you're, you know, DMing and you got to improvise on the spot. It's like playing jazz rather than classical music, but you can still do that within the parameters of, you know, preparation. And as you know, uh, uh, unlike some people, Matt Jackson, I am a preparer. I prepare things way ahead of time. I like to get in-depth and in, in nitty-gritty about everything. So I started to, you know, just get away from that in general. I might do a random thing here or there, you know, a couple orcs, but I like to prepare the stuff generally ahead of time. Now, I've always struggled, though, with making a wilderness trek interesting, whether it's wilderness, swamp, moors, forest, whatever it may be. You know, it just it seems to always be, uh, okay, nothing happened on day one in the morning and nothing happened in the afternoon, but you get an encounter at night and here it is. It, it just sucks, right? And so I, I was never able to conceptualize something in my head to make it make sense to me, to make it not boring. Now, what he did here, Sly Flourish, apply Jay Quazing the jun Dungeon. Now, it says Jay Quaying the Dungeon on this, but from what Sly Flourish said, uh, Janelle likes it Jay Quazing the Dungeon because it's Janelle Jay Quaze. So I'll respect that and call it Jay Quazing the Dungeon in my title. That's not a typo. That's a, you know, how Janelle would like to say it. So, boom, done. All right. Now, just a couple of the principles, right? So... Justin Alexander put together an analysis of how Janelle did her dungeons back in the day. And basically we came up with a bunch of concepts, uh, an understanding of what, what it looked like. One, so I'll just go through the basic principles. They're self-explanatory on their face as I read them to you, but you know, you could read the article, listen to his video as well. And uh, I'll put the links below so you can take a look, but multiple entrances is one looping around, breaking pad, uh, branching pads in the dungeon, Allow for a choice, but they're just linear in design. We've looped back and backtrack. That's a whole different thing. Multiple level connections, discontinuous level connections, um, secret and unusual paths, sub levels, divided levels, nested dungeons, um, minor elevation shifts where things go underneath and paths go over. So you're not quite sure where you are. Midpoint entry, 
um, non-Euclidean geometry. So you're not just looking at a bunch of square rooms and circular rooms and triangular rooms and passages, right? Extra dimensional spaces. And then it's a five part series by the Alexandrian, by the way, and gets into some other concepts about it. Um, size, size matters. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Beware of sprawling, have the dungeon have some sort of a structure. And I think it should also have some sort of verisimilitude that it makes sense within and of itself as the original construction of it. Why was it there? How was it made? Landmarks within the dungeon. All these things make it, you know, interesting. And, you know, that's cool for dungeons. And I like to try to do that with dungeons all the time. Um, but uh, it's harder for the wilderness. I never, I never conceived of applying this to a wilderness setting. So, of course, when I linked this uh, video I listened to today to the old old school guys in my group, the, uh, the every other Friday night we do a Tank Arts Tavern channel. Uh, I think it's first and third or second and fourth. God, I always forget. I just know it's every other Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> and uh we i linked it to them and of course that started some discussion and so i'd imagine it was an interesting enough discussion we're probably going to you know keep going on it at our next live show but i figured let me get some thoughts out because it just made me really think everyone ever hear something it's like your mind starts racing yes this makes sense i want to get into this i want to talk more about it i want to learn more about it you know you know some people say ah, i'm not going to watch that garbage of course um but you know i i think it's good because you could think about the, the the wilderness in a whole different way, all right? So like I said, you're, you're having meaningful choices when you're traveling. Um, it does require prep, right? It does require you to have some preparation within the wilderness, whatever the wilderness is, whether it's a swamp, a moor, a desert, or, you know, badlands, whatever it is, you're, you're going to have to do some preparation. Um, prepare the terrain, you know? I know it's against sort of like people thinking uh, minimal prep and go with it and roll with it, and that's fine. That's If that's your style, go for it. That, that's just not my style. So I'm thinking there might be other people here that have a different style of doing it, you know, um, you would maybe agree with mine. Now, random encounter tables, they could be good in terms of the giving an idea of what's out there, but something Tim Shorts said really got me thinking. Now, Tim Shorts is uh, from Gothard's Manor blog. He put out the Gothard's Manor zine. He has a Patreon, which is really good. He always puts out stuff on his Patreon. It's all subscribers, you know, in print stuff as well as digital. You check it out. And he has really good ideas. And he runs stuff in the Comor Forest. He ran some campaigns in the Comor Forest for us. And uh, Comor Forest is a place where every 13.7 feet, you're going to get an encounter you're going to run from. <laughs> so <laughs> pretty much explains Tim's approach to things. You don't have to live. You just have to play. And hopefully they survive, you know. But um, it, and this this thing comes down to time, right? But, but what in terms of do you have the time to do all this prep? And I understand a lot of you don't. I'm not married. I have no kids. I got a life, right? I play d and I do YouTube videos of D&D stuff. So this, I had the time to do this. If you don't, that's fine. And if you don't like it, that's fine. But what, but what Tim said started me down this train of thought, which of course is going to add much more to my workload because he was describing something as essentially um, a place where a wilderness things happen even when you're not there and i'm like holy shit this is right because the wilderness then if you look at it that way that you know things happen it means that the wilderness has and i hate to say like sound like a hippie environmentalist wilderness has an ecology it has an environment just like a as 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 you see on my map over here you know we have all these towns for my new second edition campaign coming up and what you have going here is you have parnas you have uh, the the high elves you have the, you have the wood elves you have uh, the, the dwarves, the hill dwarves, the mountain dwarves, and there's an economy going on. There's a regional economy. Just And that, that economy within this setting sets up some interactions between all the various members of this region, right? So rather than an economy within the various wilderness areas, you know, like the Marsh of Chilimber, the Lonely Moor, the High Moor, the Great Peak Mountains, the Weathercoat Forest, the Fallen Lands, the Anorak Desert, all these places don't have necessarily an economy per se, as we would understand it, but they have an ecology. All right. They have a thing where there's a lot of fixed elements in there and they all interact in some way, in some ecological way. OK. And when you add intelligent or semi-intelligent monsters into it, you have a different sort of interaction. It's not just, you know, the, the leaves fall from the trees and then and, and the birds pick up the twigs and make nests. We're not talking about just that. We're talking about the interaction of the environment with intelligent, semi-intelligent beings, monsters, creatures, whatever you want to call them in there. OK. And so that means that every single area, every single place like the Weathercoat Forest would have its own ecology, which you could look at as a regional economy of interactions amongst the various inhabitants of these places. Now, 
things are going to happen there every day, every year, every month, whatever, depending on the season, regardless of the adventures are there or not. Now, this requires you to, I think, in my eyes, set up some fixed locations, right? The hippogriffs on the mountains, um, the, the dragon in the, in the cave uh, has an effect on his area of effect, right? His area that he roams, right? The, uh, the treants, right? Where they live, the fairy creatures where they live. And they all operate within this zone, within this region of, of, uh, <clears throat> of basically uh, <laughs> this region that's particular to them. OK, and it's a, it's an effect on each other that creates ways of behavior. It's an effect on each other that they all create, which, which which effectively means that there's a story going on within this place. And when there's a story going on within this place, the players as adventurers jump into the woods. And it's not just, oh, you run into orcs and you run into the hippogriff and you run into the, the dragon. Right. Every time they run into these creatures. You're affecting the story that's going on in the in the uh, environment that you're in, right? And so, just like a regional economy, just like a a world economy or a town economy, you are affecting the ecology of this place when you kill the orcs. Maybe the orcs were the counterbalance against the goblins, and because because of you killed the whole tribe of orcs, now the goblins run rampant, and then they 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 take over the orcs' territory. Now they're threatening the hippogriffs. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe, maybe you've killed some kobolds that are the uh, dragon's minions and that makes the dragon weaker or makes the dragon come after you and your adventuring group or raid the town that you're from. You don't know. But the thing is, everything interacts with everything else and every type of ecology that you're dealing with, right? Every environment, whether it's the woods, the mountains, the forest, whatever. And then if you want to get really technical, I mean, they're all close to each other. They all affect each other on the overlap, right? The lonely moor overlapping the badlands of the Anorak desert there. That can maybe have some sort of overlapping effect and one on each, right? Maybe they interact with each other in certain ways. It just gives a whole lot of food for thought here, okay? So this is, to me, very interesting because it, it's it's setting my mind in a whole different direction, which, of course, is going to make more work. <laughs> but, again, if that was if that's what works for you, then that's what works for you. Um, I know some people like to do the uh, the old... Uh, West March's campaign where you have the, the story of the area emerges as you go. In other words, oh, you rolled a wandering encounter here on this hex there, and it comes out to be orcs. And then you rolled another one, two hexes over, which comes out to be griffins. And therefore, the DM is now scrambling or trying to create some connection of why are the orcs here and the griffins there, and then make some meaningful connection amongst them. But I don't like it because I like predictability. I like to know the story because I like to see what the story may affect. The other thing, too, is sometimes it's a freaking stretch. Why, is the, why are the orcs here and the griffins right next door? One would wipe out the other, perhaps, right? Uh, it's things like that that don't make any sense to me. A dragon and griffins living next door to each other wouldn't make any sense. So the dragons would kill the griffins and have breakfast, and that's it, right? I, I, I would rather have it plotted out and played out in my head, this whole story that's going on in an environment ahead of time. I want to know what's there. I want to know what's going on, and I want to know how the characters affect and interact with this place every time they interact with it. They're going to change something. Every time they change something, it affects everything else. It's like a bunch of dominoes or like somebody liked my analogy of a pool table before where uh, you have a, a layout. You have 15, you know, 15 balls on the table, and the PCs are the white ball. The white ball is going to bounce into something, let's say the nine ball, right? But that's the orcs. And the orcs, once you hit the nine ball, they might, they might bounce off of something else. It affects something else. The whole pool table, the whole layout changes as you go. That's the way I look at pretty much every other aspect of D&D &D in terms of the ecology, uh, the economy of all these places, right? And even mega dungeons. I mean, you're going to affect the same thing. Why not apply that to the wilderness? Why not apply that to overland encounters? It makes it way more interesting. It makes makes the place a uh, thing to discover. Like It makes the wilderness, the bigger it is, into like a form of a mega dungeon, essentially. So, I don't know. This is just what I'm thinking as I, as I go here. Um this is just stream of consciousness. I just had to get it out. I had to, in the old days, I would have had to, I got to write this down, put it on the blog. But since, you know, nobody reads anymore, <laughs> I figured I got the YouTube channel going. I figured I might as well put it up on the YouTube channel, guys. So anyway, uh, look, I'm looking for comments here, input ideas. I mean, this is just now coming to me. Tell me what you think about it. You know, like and subscribe and, you know, put some comments below. And I'm looking forward to it because I want to develop this as much as I can. I want to I want to try to apply this to my game that's coming up. So you, if you guys could figure out, you know, uh, different ways around it, or if you've done this before, or you think it's a good idea or a shitty idea, let me know. All right, I'm looking forward to any of your input or any of your comments, guys. Thank you very much for listening, and have a great day, everybody.